Welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have John Burnett. John Burnett is a Republican strategist and financial industry professional with over 20 years of experience in risk management. He's also an adjunct professor at Hampton University and New York University. He has a long extensive resume, check out his bio when you get a moment. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. All right, John, listen. Before the show, you said <laughs> somebody told you this was going to be painful. You're a smart guy. I don't think this is going to be painful for you, brother. So let's get into it. Part of what we're going to discuss today, the reality of voting rights in the United States of America. So let me give a little bit of context for the discussion. Obviously, everyone is well aware that we've had more voter laws passed during the last legislative state legislative cycle than in the history of us dealing with voting laws. And it all came from one particular platform. It came from the idea that the election was rigged and the election was stolen from Donald Trump. So I have to first ask you, and I don't wanna presume what you believe about that. So I'm going to ask you, do you believe the election was in fact stolen from Donald J Trump? I believe that there are some fundamental flaws in our electoral process that needed that needs to be addressed. I think whether you're a Democrat or Republican or in the middle or politically agnostic, you can actually agree that many people are left on voter rolls who are either dead or moved out of state. And it was especially problematic when you had state states mail out ballots statewide with a, I don't want to say a corrupt, because that's that, that would be unfair, uh, inaccurate voter rolls. So I think that this is an opportunity for us to make sure that we reinstill trust in our electoral process by making sure that not only are our voter rolls clean, but we have other controls in place. And I mean controls in a good sense, to make sure that you know what the the efficacy, the reliability, and other things are um, where it should be, so that way it gains trust of the electorate. As you could, I'm from New York, as you could tell, even in the primary, Democratic primary, 135 or 120, at least 125,000 test ballots or part of the original vote count, right? So there are so many different issues going on in different municipalities. We just gotta clean up clean up our act across the board. Man, that was a very professorial answer. Um, so, <laughs> so let me once again ask you, because you did not answer the exact question, but I do agree with you that voting irregularities do happen. But Democrats have been claiming these irregularities must be challenged and transformed. So we have been saying that, but this is something a little different, brother. This is something that that is so extreme to say that um, state governments, the judiciary, um, as well as left-leaning media conspired against one man being Donald Trump and literally stole an entire election. Now I get what you said, and I agree with 90% of what you said, but I do want you to directly answer, do you believe the election was in fact stolen from Donald Trump? I'll say the, the, there are many parts of this election uh, that came down to specific swing states uh, where the irregularities provided an, env- an environment of unfairness. That's the best you're gonna get out of me. Man, you're not gonna answer the damn question. (laughs) All right, okay, so let me move on to the next topic. Not next topic, but next question. There are some laws that were passed because of this big lie. I consider it to be a big lie. Any irregularity that was noted was not statistically significant enough to overturn the election. I know that a lot of emphasis was placed on Georgia. That was done so by Trump himself and also his former attorney Rudy Giuliani. But even if they won Georgia, let's talk in a hypothetical place in La La Land. 
even if he won Georgia, he still loses the electoral college vote and he loses the popular vote. Uh, even if he won some of these other states in question, he still loses the election. And I don't think people are thinking about it mathematically when they say, well, this state had this problem and this state had that problem. But when you combine both of those states, he still loses. He still does not get the constitutional mandate to govern. He still loses the electoral college vote. Well, well, when you take, let's say three states in particular, right? Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Arizona. Arizona is still going through their recount. And I'm hearing that there's some positive elements coming out of that in terms of the voter irregularities. What's going uh, but, to happen, but, but, professor? But, 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 but also, you're, you're a lawyer as well, right? No, so no, I'm, know, not, I'm in law school. I'm oh, not you're in law yet. school. I'm in law right? school. Yes. So, but you, but but you have that you you have that lawyer look to you, right? <laughs> I'm working um, on it. <laughs> that right balance, no pun intended. Uh, however, th- 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 you know or should know in your first year of law school that the state state officials cannot uh, uh, unilaterally change election law. That needs to come down to the state legislatures, right? Now, wait a minute. When you say, do you mean federal officials or are you talking like, about state like, like governor or state attorney or any other state official that one in the per, that one person or a, a collective of two or three of them cannot unilaterally change election law? That was against the law to begin with, right? No, and that's not those- true. Let me give some pushback to that. That's not true. Okay. Um, Pre clearance which was a Supreme Court ruling that said particular states that have a history of violating the constitutional voting rights of particular demographics must go through a clearance process with the Department of Justice in order to change the election in their local state. You are familiar with the Supreme Court saying we're going to now set that aside as a ruling and the United States Congress will have to now uh, jump in and change the statute. But but when when, when was that when was that passed? When was that stated? Uh, this was just a few years ago, brother. The the Voting okay. Rights Act was set aside, um, which was uh, codified through a Supreme Court ruling that said, listen, for these particular states, they must go through a Department of Justice clearance process in order to change their election rules. That's what that said. So the Supreme Court set that aside and said, now the United States Congress will have to simply make a law if they want these states to be protected. And it was so interesting because the logic of the Supreme Court when they did that was that it was no longer necessary that elections were basically fair, that elections were freely accessible to all people, that these discriminatory practices no longer were taking place. And it was not an issue of judicial remedy anymore. And let's they decided talk, to come out details, of judicial right? remedy. Let's talk details, let's, let's, we're both professors. So let's, let's act like this is an exam, right? Not, sure. not some, some, some abstract conversation. What specific actions in fine detail were, were, were found to, to violate individual voting rights. So let me go so down to this. People never talk in specifics. But I, I do. So let me give you some specifics. Let me go to Senate Bill 202. Uh, that is a state Senate bill out of the state of Georgia. Now, the first thing I want to correct you on, Professor, is that state governments, uh, they do have the ability to dictate the processes of how and when a person votes. Uh, They can change the time from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. if they choose. They can do weekend voting or weekday voting if they choose. They can employ early voting or absentee voting if they choose. They can have locations for people to vote. That is not every state. Sir, sir, unless, Professor, unless the constitution of that state specifically prohibits it. That is the only caveat to what I just said. The state and of Georgia did not. In Pennsylvania, it has to go through the state legislature. So let, let's talk about Georgia and then we'll go to Pennsylvania. Okay. In the state of Georgia, you have a state Senate bill called Senate Bill 202. Mm-hmm. In that state Senate bill, it did a few things. One, it made it against the law, it made it an actual misdemeanor punishable by up to a year in prison. If you handed somebody water or a snack while waiting in line to vote. Now that even received criticism from Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham said, I don't know why they put that in the bill. That came from a Republican, but they put it in the bill for a very specific reason. Churches and nonprofit organizations 
They were running commercials, nonpartisan by the way. They were running commercials saying, hey, if you have to stand in these long lines, which by the way, all of the long lines in Georgia are in black neighborhoods, 100%, virtually no exception. So they said in order to make sure people know that they will be hydrated, that they will have opportunity for snacks, we are going to run advertisements telling people, listen, if you come to the precinct, we're gonna make sure that you have water, you have Gatorade, you have snacks. That's all they did. And that did make more people feel comfortable about going out and standing in a long line in order to participate in the election. So now, they made- well, It sounds like you had more than water. It sounds like you drank Kool-Aid. So let, let me oh, let me oh, ask wait you. a minute. That was that was <laughs> almost funny, Professor. So so go <laughs> ahead and go ahead and speak on that law. Speak on that provision. Does so, that so, make so, sense to you? So so I, I I'm not a lawyer. I'm a businessman, right? Mm -hmm. So so let let me let me tell you exactly how it goes down in New York. But right? brother, I don't, talk I, about the bill. I just because you asked me about a specific. I, I, I just I'm, gave I'm, you one specific. Drawing, I got drawing, a bunch of I'm, them. I'm drawing a parallel. Okay. Right in a democratic state, democrat state, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so there are certain laws in New York mm -hmm. where you where you cannot campaign, where 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 uh, uh, within a certain distance of the polling station, meaning that you can't pass out water, you can't pass out anything. That's not what the New York polling station. As, as a candidate, that is as, not what the as a, as a pack. So or any, or, or, or in, in anything political, you cannot do that. Why? Because if, if an individual accepts something from you, whether it's mm -hmm. a piece of literature or otherwise, then that person might feel obligated to consider your candidate, right? Or whichever party or position you, you're, you're lobbying or stand for. So to remove all of that confusion and so-called pressure, okay. you cannot do certain activities within certain distance yeah. of the polling station. So that let me is break it in down. a blue state. Okay, so brother. Let me break it. Let me break down where you're wrong at. Give me give me an opportunity to respond to that. You're yes. conflating two things that do not actually exist together. Um, it is correct that campaigning within the statutory limits of a polling precinct is against the law. It's against the law in New York. It has always been against the law in Georgia. It's against the law in every single state in the United States of America. That law has been established for decades, brother. We're not talking about that law. You're conflating a new law which says you don't have to be campaigning. You do not have to be engaged in electioneering. Simply bringing somebody water as a nonpartisan, nonpolitical organization is now an actual crime based on that sentence. Have you ever run for office? Hell no, brother. So, so, so let, let me. So, so let's say <laughs> let, let's let's say I was running for office, right? Okay. We all know, right? We all know people skirt the rules. Oh come on, man! You can't you can't justify a bad law. This is a bad law, brother. Come on, you're a businessman. It's a bad law. So if I wanted to skirt the law, what I would do, what I would do, is take those water bottles, mm. take my my beautiful smile, right, my mm. campaign picture, right, and relabel the water bottles. But that's against the law. And pass those out. But that's professor, you, that's you can't against can't, the law, professor. Why can't you pass out water? That's because you, if you're using it, let, let me explain. You asked a question. To combine those two things together, sir. In terms of passing no, out, it's a dumbass law, and you know it, brother. Mm -hmm. within, within a certain distance. Okay. All right. We're going to go to the next point. Bottom line is a dumbass law. It criminalizes individuals who are not engaging in electioneering whatsoever. And it was only set forth in order to penalize those that motivated a particular group of people in a particular demographic fair, to the polls. Fair okay. free election is not not undue, uh, engaging in undue influence. All right, brother. All right, we're gonna disagree on the water being illegal 
in a voting line when it was never illegal before the Senate Bill 202 in the state of Georgia. Let me ask you about this entire push from Republicans, mainly conservatives, who are saying that the United States Congress, and I'm specifically talking about acts like the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, right? HR1, dealing with how we unify or create a uniform code in our election processes. There are people who say that Congress does not have the constitutional authority to dictate to states how to actually run elections. What do you say to that? Let's talk again, let's talk about the details of the bill, right? Not this high level element. But I'll answer your question because I don't want people, your viewers to say, this guy doesn't like to answer questions and he's a professor. What, what, let's say his students don't want to answer questions, right? That would be unfair. So, so I think, I, think the, we, we, I believe in federalism. Uh, I think uh, it should be left up to the states, right? I don't think the government should, should do overreach by dictating how states should govern their elections, right? That's number one. Number do you think two, it's unconstitutional? Uh, according to the way the Constitution is written and what I've heard and what I observed, uh, I think it's an overreach uh, by the federal government. Let but, me explain but, something to you. Okay, I, I'm gonna let you respond. So you it, think it's overreach by the federal government. I respect your opinion, but your opinion is not rooted in fact, Professor. Um, the truth is the federal government does have the constitutional authority to deal with election laws. Let me read something to you. This is from the US Constitution, Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1. Here's what it says verbatim. The times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. That's your state law, that's your state constitutional mandate, that states have the authority to do this. And then it says, semicolon, but. And that's the part that no one wants to read on the right. It says, but the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations. That's in the Constitution, brother. That's in the US Constitution. So the Constitution literally is contradicting what those on the right are saying is unconstitutional. It is very constitutional for the US Congress to be involved in changing election laws in the United States of America. So 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 let's so in terms of time and place, right? So we have to look at at what the words actually mean, add context to that. When you look at the federal law, is it saying that now it should be legal for ballot harvesting? To, to do mail in voting and all these other things that are governed. You don't think mail in voting is legal? You don't think mail in voting is legal? And executing, I'm, 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 I'm take my comments in totality, sir. Okay. What I'm saying is that those words after the colon or semicolon, I forgot which one you said, that doesn't mean that the federal government can come in and completely take over and dictate every aspect of the electoral process. That would be false and misleading, sir. Mm, okay, uh, that's interesting. So let me ask you this question. Do you believe- and, 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 and Can I interject another uh -huh. parallel, right? Because parallel provides understanding. Okay. Many people on the left are quick to misquote and misunderstand certain things in the constitution. Like you just to did. Try to, to try to prove their own point. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to free speech, the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, they don't want to follow those words. Okay, brother, you go, you're kind of going all over the place. So uh, it was actually you who misrepresented the Constitution uh, by saying that this was basically an overreach of the federal government. When the Constitution says it is, it is not an overreach, it, it's actually words, part of the, the constitutional words, uh, a constitutional the platform. The federal government. Okay. Absolute authority over. All the right, brother. That's not that's not what I said. That's not what I said on this show. But I made it very clear that anyone who says the federal government or the United States Congress cannot get involved in changing election law 
is absolutely wrong based on the Constitution. And, and, and I read to you where it's at in the Constitution. I source my data, I source my information on the show. And, and what I said to you and to your viewers, sir, mm -hmm. that the bill that you had mentioned, all the items in the bill, that's why I wanna talk specifics. So what well, items in the bill do you not like? The bill itself is an overreach. Okay, in brother, capital. just tell me what part of the bill I you do not a few, like. A few okay, let's talk about some that you like actually ballot, gave. Like ballot harvesting. All right, and you also said- uh, mandating, mandating ballot harvesting is okay. an overreach by the federal government. All right, brother, I have a limited amount of time. You also talked about uh, mail-in voting, which is really ironic to me that somehow that has become a great evil or prohibition. Number one, the vast majority of state legislatures that approve mail-in voting were Republican-led legislatures who approved mail-in voting 10, 15 years ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, the President of the United States has always voted by way of mail-in voting, absentee voting. And now all of a sudden we're saying that that is illegal. That means that everybody who participated in this democracy before these new laws came into being or new proposals came into being voted illegally. Is that what you're saying? Yes, just so, just so that you're- Including the President. Just so your, view, your viewers are not misled, mm -hmm. right? In terms of absentee voter or other extreme circumstances, that has, has always been permitted by mail, but not mail in balloting to replace going to the poll. See, it's very important that we get this right okay. and share the right understanding uh -uh. that mail in balloting, you say that was passed 15 years ago. Yeah. Most people, most people never even heard of mail in balloting being part of the regular electoral process because it is not. For absentee balloting mm. and other extreme circumstances, not for the norm. So, so you're important. saying, let me get this right. And we get the right understanding. Okay, so let me. Let me make sure I clarify what you're saying. You're saying that that absentee voting or mail-in voting should be permissible under select circumstances and not permissible as a formation of normative democracy. Whatever, right, because our infrastructure is not set up for that. We talked about irregularities from the very beginning. Who gets to make that decision? Dead people on voter rolls, people that move to different states. And Professor, just, who makes the decision? Mass okay, I got you, brother. Listen, I got I got like two minutes left. Who, okay. in your opinion, makes the decision as to what selected group should be able to absentee vote? Who? Here's, here's, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think we could agree on what I'm about to say. Let's put it to the electorate. What do you want? And let's pass it state by state, and not allow either just the governor. Or state, uh, state attorney general, or an elected body, state body of officials decide for the voters. Let's okay. set up a referendum in each state and see what the people want. Yeah, I'm actually not against those referendums statewide. Those referendums um, have been significantly impactful and beneficial, especially uh, in some southern states. For example, in the state of Georgia. Uh, there was a referendum uh, put on the ballot during the last election that said, should we get rid of qualified immunity basically? And the people in Georgia, uh, still a Republican state, they say, yes, we need to get rid of qualified immunity for government workers, uh, i.e. the police, right? And so in the state it's state the of Georgia, but, but all right, hold on, we, we, we'll debate that next time. But the state of Georgia, now a uh, superior court judge can actually lay aside qualified immunity in certain circumstances because of that ballot initiative. But Professor, I want to have you back on the show. Let's talk to. about qualified immunity next time, all right? Absolutely. Thank you, man. I appreciate you being on Indisputable. You got it.